Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pascal Peduzzi. I'm the director of Grid Geneva at the United Nations Environment Programme. The topic of today is uh, what do policymakers want from scientists? I'm myself a scientist and uh, my work is to supply policymakers with policy relevant science on climate change and environment. In 2012, uh, one of the studies we did was the foresight on emerging issues. And the uh, issue ranking four uh, was broken bridges, reconnecting science and policy. And it's true that in our global environmental change, our society uh, needs strategies and policies that are underpinning the strong science and evident base. And this broken bridge is hindering the development of uh, solutions to global environmental changes. And this problem requests a new look at the way that science is organized and how the science policy interface can be improved. One of the issues we have is that most policymakers have done law and political science or economics and uh, they not necessarily well into science. On the other hand, uh, the scientists, they have you know, little interest for politics sometimes or at least very few of them are running for politics. So uh, we have on one hand a community that um, is mostly uh, talking about um, things like uh, facts, uh, statistical probabilities, margin of errors, limitations and other caveats and that conclude their scientific paper with more research is needed. And this kind of language is exactly uh, what the non-scientists have difficulty to listen to. On the other hand, we have policymakers that uh, have their own view on what is important and that includes uh, being re-elected. They need answers about uh, what can be done uh, to solve immediate issues. And when you come with new threats and problems, th this is not necessarily welcome because it is adding on all the stuff that they already have to deal with. And especially if you're not coming with solutions. Um, so this is on the problem. On one side, you have the scientists that apparently choose not to be understood and addressing to the policymakers who on the whole world will prefer not to hear anyway. So we need to bridge uh, the, this communication gap. And one of the ways is that policymakers need to know about problems, but preferably if it comes with solutions. Scientists who want to be heard, they need to speak clearly and uh, demonstrate why political action is needed. Scientists may also highlight the political risk for non-action. And when talking to policymakers, scientists should refrain from saying more research is needed because that could be interpreted like, oh, they're not really sure about what they're saying. Here is an example about the climate change. When the IPCC uh, report was published, the third one in 2001 was saying that the role, uh, the impact of on, uh, human activities on climate change was likely, that is more than 66%. In the fourth assessment, this um, role of uh, human activities was increased to very likely in terms of uh, confidence, which is 90% confidence that we think that humans have an impact on uh, the climate change. On the AR5, it was raised to extremely likely, which is more than 95%. We do not need to wait for being virtually certain to take actions. There is enough evidence to take action now. The real question that we need to address with uh, policymakers are what are the most effective ways uh, to reduce our greenhouse gases emissions? And where will be the main impacts? And what can be done to adapt? We know that we will have more energy into the system, more uh, warmer oceans and, and more energy in the atmosphere, which will translate in higher energy waves and winds, which will intensify. We will have um, both more frequent and more intense heat waves, and drought and flood patterns will change. Sea level rise uh, will affect our aquifers because with a uh, higher level of water, um, this salty water will, will infiltrate in the water aquifers, which means that some wells will no longer be supplying fresh water. On the other hand, we will have uh, beach erosion. So our beaches uh, uh, offering services against storm surge, but also uh, where tourism infrastructure can operate. But if the land is eroding, the oil infrastructures will uh, be exposed to water. Climate change is not the only issue we have to deal with. It's also about the decline of ecosystems. For instance, a healthy forest is providing evapotranspiration, which is uh, helping to create new clouds, providing water uh, inland with more rainfall that can go further in, uh, in the land. Now, with deforestation, 
uh, you no longer have any protections for water courses, those ones may dry out. And when the clouds are coming, uh, the rain is no longer um, protected uh, by the canopy, and so the soil is exposed, offering more landslide susceptibility and soil erosion. And with no evapotranspiration, this leads to further uh, flood, and inland you have more drought. Now, with more drought, this leads to more forest fires, which is inducing further deforestation. So here is we have a loop that we don't want to enter into that. So only reforestation and protection of forests can protect us from this uh, virtual uh, loop. Now, another problem is the, the further increase of temperatures in the pole as compared to uh, the equator. Smaller differences of temperatures between uh, those two regions are weakening high altitude winds, such as the jet streams. With longer periods of similar weather, um, which is induced by this phenomenon, we have a slower alternation between cold and hot, wet and dry uh, weather patterns. And the longer duration of similar weather is contributing to extreme events, such as heat and cold waves, floods and drought. In the mountainous area, with a higher limit between slow and rain, the glaciers are retreating and they are not necessarily providing the same level of um, water holding as when they were bigger. So with the smaller um, glaciers, you do not have uh, enough water capacity to be hold. When it rains, it rains all in one go. And then during the dry season, those glaciers are no longer providing um, this water supply. And so you have more floods and more drought. The permafrost limit will also be higher, meaning that the rocks uh, will have less stability, and if the rock is falling into a lake, it can create a, gla a glacial lake outburst flooding. So climate change will affect a large area, in mountainous, in coastal area, well, nearly everywhere, and policymakers need to prioritize their choice. We cannot build wall and infrastructures to protect against those hazards everywhere. We cannot, you know, put concrete everywhere. If we look at the island of Jamaica, all around the island you have coastal ecosystem. It's like a security belt. Coastal ecosystem not only provides protections against storm surge, uh, against wave energy, they also provide all kinds of ecosystem services, such as uh, storing carbon, providing home for biodiversity, supporting fisheries, um, they are um, providing multiple types of services. So we need to know, and that's where science needs to be improved, we need to have better facts and figures on the role of ecosystem for disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Because so far the engineering community, they know very well how much uh, you need to place, what is the height of the, of the wall, what is the width of the, the protection that you need to place. Uh, but those um, numbers are not well known for the width of ecosystems, and that's where we need to have further uh, detail from scientists to help policymakers in making cost analysis uh, between grey and green engineering. Sometimes you can combine those grey and green engineering. Grey infrastructures are sometimes more appropriate because they're quicker, but you cannot place them everywhere. And combination of green and grey engineering should also be considered because that can help to reduce the size and numbers of the grey infrastructures. Now, ecosystems is the no-regret options because they're natural, environmentally friendly, they're cost-effective, they're easy to implement and can be done with local population. They request low, if any, maintenance. They're self-replicating, they've got aesthetical value, they store carbon and they support biodiversity. So, what we need now is scientists who can help the policymakers to place the, the figures for uh, these um, ecosystem so that we know what is the alternative. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very successful end of the conference. Bye-bye.